Hello, and welcome to the Data Engineering Podcast, the show about modern data management. Imagine catching data issues before they snowball into bigger problems. That's what Datafold's new monitors do. With automatic monitoring for cross-database data diffs, schema changes, key metrics, and custom data tests, you can catch discrepancies and anomalies in real time right at the source. Whether it's maintaining data integrity or preventing costly mistakes, Datafold monitors give you the visibility and control you need to keep your entire data stack running smoothly. Want to stop issues before they hit production? Learn more at dataengineeringpodcast.com slash datafold today. Your host is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Adrian Bruderu and Marcin Rudolph, co-founders at DLT Hub, about the growth of DLT and the numerous ways that you can use it to address the complexities of data integration. So Adrian, can you start by introducing yourself? Sure. So I'm a data professional. I got into the data field 12 years ago. I built data platforms for startups and enterprises. And in my last five years, I would say I was doing lots of build and hire projects, consulting and data engineering. And I guess, you know, the reason why I'm here is because I saw a need for people like us, for data engineers, namely we didn't have dev tools and uh, I decided to do something about it. And Marcin, how about yourself? Yeah, so uh, my background is actually software engineering and uh, I'm doing this for like a really long time, for 30 years. In that time, I did a lot of different things, like from the telco software, some, you know, data factories in the early 2000s, search engines, blockchain, and now I'm doing this. And I think it's the, my best, best geek in my life. Yes. So we do a lot of open source, a lot of coding, which I really love. And uh, we are also helping people to build and automate stuff. So, you know, you apply your engineering. This is uh, extremely fulfilling and I really like it. And going back to you, Adrian, for people who haven't listened to your previous appearance on the show, if you can just uh, bring us back to how you first got started working in data. Yeah. So I don't know, 12 years ago, I started as an analyst. I did five years of startups. I quickly started building things end to end. And the thing about startups is you don't really have a budget. So I was doing a lot of hands-on building, really. I got, after about five years, I basically switched to consulting because it gave me the chance to actually work more, as strange as that sounds. So it's more about the work, less about, let's say, the social contract. And here is where basically I found the need uh, for DLT and uh, Martin here is helping uh, build it. So yeah, um, if I can chip in, like I, I I was doing a lot of machine learning before I go to school. So actually, I, I had a startup which is do, was doing a search engine for mobile applications. We did a lot of mach, machine learning topic uh, uh, inference. Uh, we also built a vector database without even knowing. So yes, I, I did a lot of data before, but maybe I was not aware. That is actually a data engineering at the time. It was 2009, so quite long ago. And bringing us to the conversation today, you've both been working very hard on building the DLT framework, the DLT hub business around it. For folks who want to get a bit more into some of the core of what is DLT, how does it work, I'll refer them back to the previous episode we did back in September of 2023. And so for people who haven't listened to that yet, if you could just give a quick overview about what is DLT and then talk a bit about some of the notable ways that it has evolved since we last spoke. Yeah, so basically DLT is the first pip install dev tool for data engineers by data engineers, build pipelines fast, easy, and robust. It's just everyday boilerplate code for things like incremental loading, automatic schema inference, schema evolution. This is where we started, but in one year, our vision has expanded a lot. So with the continuous support of the community, we actually evolved into a very comprehensive Python library for moving data. We are well integrated with the modern data stack components. It works with hyper performance Python data libraries like Pyro, Polars, IBIS, DuckDB, Delta. And um, yeah, it actually works very well on industrial scale, even in constrained environments. We added things like data contracts, parallelism. But I guess one of the biggest things that we're seeing is an explosion in lake house adoption. This is something that we are seeing quite a bit of user pull from. Yeah, and as, as for adoption, I would say we reached 600K monthly downloads, which is I guess 10 times higher than any other competitor in our space and our users built over 10k private sources by this time 
Yeah, and they're they're using it for all kinds of things, including building rags, things like that. As you have been going along this journey, building DLT, continuing to invest in and evolve it, what are some of the core principles that help to guide your work on that project? So, all right, so we actually have like a very clear principles how we build the product, how we operate in this like a open source ecosystem. Yes. So one core principle is like DLT is a library; it's not a platform. Yes. So what does it mean? that if someone writes code, it's using library or a library to, to write this code. So you add library to your code. You don't add your code to someone else's platform, yes? So the outcome of this is that we are trying to fit in into existing ecosystem. We are trying to work with everyone. We are not replacing anyone, yes? Which typical platform does, it's replace some other platforms. We are trying to fit in, yes? So this is, this is the first principle. So when you design when you look at uh, at the other projects, yes, you always look for for ways to interact to cooperate. The other one is like a, we are trying to really automate everything. Yes, so you should do things once, and this is like a, this uh, this principle of efficiency that, that applies both to us and how we think about our users. This is also like an important thing. Then we have like a no black box principles. Uh, when uh, everything should be customizable, you should be able to change everything you want. So we also respect autonomy of the users. Yes. So like uh, by letting them hack, letting letting them change everything, and uh, you know also looking in the, into the code. So I think this is like a very important. And I mean we also go to great length to for our users to do less work. We do more work for our in order for our users to do less. Yes. So we. It's for me like a very important thing. So if I'm an engineer, I, I should have some empathy toward other, toward other engineers. And this is one of the principles. So you need to be really empathetic. And then, then it, uh, you can write really good code and really can help other people. And from that point of platforms and the impact that they have on the overall architecture and approach that teams take to their data management, as a framework and as a library and in some of your blog posts you've taken a very opinionated stance against the idea of using these managed extract and load services i'm wondering if you can talk a bit more about what you see as the shortcomings of those platforms and what are the situations where you would actually argue in favor of their use yeah i would say this is a question about somebody else that you're asking here um and the way i would answer it is that we're actually very focused on our own principles and we don't worry too much uh what other people do simply put what we want to achieve we haven't seen anyone be able to manage that by offering managed extract load services so basically the whole concept i would say is competing with the openness that we offer and at the same time for us to become a standard we want to be adopted freely by other vendors as well right so um so you know this means that we just cannot compete there it's i would say this is a shortcoming for us when it comes to the end user you know it very much depends on the persona if you're building something large with custom requirements you're probably better off having customizable solutions yeah so we are coming from like a very different let's say space so actually dlt comes from like this all this machine learning revolution ai revolution like a and the ecosystem with python libraries so Actually, what we are what we are looking at is like a, to have this pip install experience, so you can actually pip install data platform, and uh, you are autonomous. You run on your own premises. It's often local workflow or single machine workflow. So actually, we are quite orthogonal to this thing that you call managed services. We are trying to follow very different patterns. Yes, very different usage patterns, very different workflows that are possible for this Python ecosystem and impossible for the uh, managed solutions. And of course, vice versa. There are certain workflows that are way easier when you have a managed solution, but we don't think we compete with this. And I think that in that context as well, the places where I would say that the managed platform does make more sense is if you don't have a team that has the engineering acumen to build those custom options and you just need to be able to pull data from one place to another particularly if it's a 
widely used pattern where you have good support for the sources and destinations that you're working with. Absolutely. So we actually sometimes see users saying like, ah, um, why in DLT I need code to do this or that? You know, we tell them go use Fivetran. From that perspective too, as you said, you're not looking to necessarily replace anyone. So I'm curious what you have seen as far as the types of teams and engineers that are using DLT. What is the overlap that you've observed as far as people who are using both DLT and another option where they use that other option for those um, well-paved paths and they use DLT for the more custom requirements. So I would say there are a couple of patterns that I see, and that is what I call first-time data platform and second-time data platform. So the first-time data platform is something that people just build quick and dirty. They just, whatever, they put it together, it works, kind of like what you're talking about, the tried and true patterns. But then there comes the point when something doesn't work. Then you start looking for a solution, you find DLT, and some people stop there and they just, you know, have a DLT pipeline running alongside other things. But many people at some point, they reach the point where they go like, okay, but why do I have two solutions? I could just use one solution. Or they get to the point where, why am I paying this much for event ingestion on Fivetran or something like that, or SQL copy on Fivetran, right? And then they start migrating more. And then we see the pattern of the second time build or the second time data platform where let's say these people have already experienced what the first time data platform is like. And let's say reigning in the entropy that is created in such places is very difficult. So they just start with engineering better best practices from the start and then you know DLT is a no-brainer choice kind of for these situations. Since the last time that we spoke, there has been a lot of evolution in the space of data movement. Some of the most notable pieces being what you mentioned earlier, mentioned about the increased growth of AI and the requirements of data movement and customization as far as how that data is moved. And from the competitive landscape, Pi Airbyte has seen a lot of investment since the last time that we spoke. And I'm wondering if you can talk to some of the ways that those pressures and those evolutions in the broader ecosystem have informed the way that you think about the development and positioning of DLT? So yes, this is this is a very good question. And uh, so maybe a little bit background where we are coming from. So actually DLT is coming from this revolution that is happening right now. So where we started the project, our way to convince people that actually we are doing something interesting, something new was to telling everyone, you know, there is some revolution happening. It's a, this revolution happens in ML, yes? So there are people using these libraries, doing these new workflows, very autonomous uh, local workflows, for example, yes? And now we were sure this revolution is gonna come to the data space. At some point, people will realize, actually you can put together a lot of Python stuff and build your own data platform, can install it, and you have, can have the same kind of experience that these data, data scientists have. So uh, our feeling and our, we, we are just going with this revolution, yes? And we are, uh, we are, we are there for the, for the whole time, yes? So uh, you were asking about what changed in, uh, in, uh, in DLT. So we had a typical transition from like a, you know, this very nice JSON parser that is creating relational structures into data movement library that is like integrating with all this ecosystem of, of other libraries. And yeah, so that's my feeling. Yes, we, we, we are simply there. Yes, we are simply there. Whatever happens in the Python space that is beneficial to some a part of ecosystem, we are also benefiting. So I don't know, like if there is a new version of the LLM from open, uh, open AI coming, like, a, I don't know, this, this mini stuff recently, O1. We also benefit, yes, it knows DLT <laughs> and it helps our users right away to, to write the code. So this is actually very interesting and <laughs> we love it. Actually, we love this, uh, this kind of revolution happening. This is what we are betting on. Also, if I can build on the LLMs part, it's, there's a little joke I like to make. While other people add uh, LLMs or AI to their products, we added our product to LLMs. So basically, if you go now on the newest LLM models, you don't need any plugins, any rags. You can just ask it for a DLT pipeline. It will go online, search for documentation, and build it for you. Yeah, we, maybe other, other good example is how we interact with the Vector databases. So actually, you have LanceDB, for example or you have uh, you have uh, embedded quadrant uh, and you know this is this is another library for us and we are so tightly integrated it's like a, you know it's like a one one thing that you interact together it's very different to like a being a destination 
you know, on some SaaS platform. It's like a, your workflow, your one notebook. And so you do it in the same way you did interact with the other libraries. Pushing a little bit more on the differentiation between DLT and some of the platform approaches. I think one of the things that those platforms offer is the state management for things like incremental loads, where you can say, okay, it's going to maintain the checkpoint information about what was the last thing that I loaded? Where do I pick up from there? What is your approach for being able to manage some of that state storage and incremental and kind of resuming incremental loads for people who are building with DLT? Yeah, this is a very good question. And I think we have very smart way of doing that. So simply for us, the state is a part of the data. Uh, so if you if you uh, have any kind of destination, I mean, your destination is able to store some kind of state, yes? So we ship the data together with the metadata to the destination. And we also load it in, a, in a, like a, let's say, atomic way. So I think it's very robust uh, way of handling state. So if your data loads and all the checks are passing, also your state loads. So if anything works uh, okay, and you resume uh, your load, you're gonna get the state that's always matching your data. So actually you use the destination to store the state. If you want to abstract and store the state somewhere else, you can. Of course, it's a library, so the state is like a kind of context that you can swap. But uh, for the average user, it's a seamless experience. You don't need any kind of additional setup. You just load the destination to Postgres, to Snowflake, to file system, to even to vector databases, and you get the state automatically stored. Yeah, and if I can, uh, you know how, for example, with Airflow, you would manage your state in Airflow, which means Airflow has to be running and functional for your pipeline to run. What uh, we do with DLT, because uh, we persist in state of the destination, is we support serverless cases very well, right? So if you want to run on Git actions, if you want to run on serverless functions, anything like that, you don't need anything local to persist the state. Yeah, so our preferred way of uh, working with incremental loads actually is to wipe out everything after every turn. And we're going to restore the whole pipeline very quickly from the destination in a clean state with the last state and, and uh, run it for the new, let's say, set of data. You mentioned also the growth and evolution of the Python ecosystem and how because you're just a Python library, you get to benefit from that as well. That ecosystem has also seen a lot of growth and investment, particularly in the data-oriented set of libraries and frameworks. So I'm thinking in particular, a lot of the rustification with things like the Data Fusion library and PyEra has seen a lot of growth and investment. And I'm curious if you can talk to some of the developments in that overall ecosystem of libraries, frameworks, and the Python runtime itself that you have been able to benefit from and you're most excited about? Yeah, so um, this is a really interesting question. So probably you need to stop me at some point because there are so many libraries that we are like a integrated or work with that, you know, I can, I can, yeah, probably go for a long time, but we see a few trends, uh, if you, I can group them. So one trend is like a this single node or like a single machine computing and uh, portable data engines, uh, like a, a DarkDB or this data fusion stuff, or, or even LanceDB, you could call it data engineers. Uh, then we have open storage formats and associated libraries like a, you know, PyIceberg or uh, Delta RS. And uh, we also have a really, I love this development with the Arrow uh, and Pi Arrow. So it's like a, you standardize this in-memory tab uh, table format and also compute. So, so this, those are the trends that I see. And now if you go through this, uh, we of course have, uh, um, have um, DuckDB, yes, we, which we use everywhere. Like uh, it's, uh, first of all, it's a way to onboard our users to give them that's this local experience that doesn't need any kind of credentials. They can try everything. They can produce, they can develop local. It's improving the uh, developer experience so much that it's, it's hard to explain is how, how much change it was for, for us when DuckDB appeared, yes? Then we have, uh, of course, I mentioned Arrow. Uh, I mentioned Polars, uh, Pandas, and all this like uh, way to work with the ta uh, tabular data. So those are primary citizens for us. So we can load them directly. Everything that works for, you know, like a dictionaries, like a, or JSON, works also for them. Incremental loading, a CD2, uh, merges, and so on. So it's like a native citizen. Then we have these libraries with, for the open uh, um, table formats, and uh, we actually use them a lot. Uh, we built uh, uh, 
Delta Lake using Delta RS serverless. Um, we have some big uh, deployments already in production. And there are some other libraries, so maybe less mentioned, but super important. And I think they really show how much you benefit by being a part of the ecosystem, by trying to fit in, not to replace. Yes. So even if you look at, as, as, uh, at something super old like SQL Alchemy, I recently added SQL Alchemy destination and, uh, and, uh, and a source. And now you have like hundreds of the databases. And you know, we put some work to do the mergers, CD2 and incremental loading. And you know, the, uh, even obscure databases are right now supported. So I could enumerate a lot. We benefit from SQL Glot, and we benefit from FSPEC, which is like abstraction the file system, a lot from Pydantic, for example, to create data contracts that actually people understand from other work. That's that's really like a you know, there are libraries for entity recognition that we use to put the data contracts that are actually for the PAI data. I don't know, like a spicy, yes, that you can detect all the on the entities that are PAI or Microsoft Presidio. Yeah, I agree. It's very easy to wax poetic about all of the interesting things that are going on in that space. So it's definitely great to see the amount of investment and integration that you've done. Yeah, and this is... I. I must say this is super natural for us. Yes, so uh, it's not that we are doing this integration for the integration sake. We see a value for, coming from that. We see how this works together and it's like a multiplier. Yes, we are not adding, we are multiplying. It's like a, one of our, let's say, core principles. On that point too, of being able to customize and build all kinds of use cases around DLT. One of the things that helps most with adoption for a project like DLT is the overall developer experience, the onboarding. I'm wondering if you can talk to some of the notable investments that you've made in that user experience of building with DLT, composing pipelines, and some of the ways that you think about the interfaces for source and destination development? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, we are by nature very close to the code. Yes, we are library, so we interact with the code. And I think that it's our DNA to make this, uh, make this development experience easy. Yes. Uh, I'm a software engineer, so I also like, a, I'm trying to keep this uh, thing good for people that want to build, that want to uh, want to write code. So I mentioned this Doug D thing. It's like it improved a lot the onboarding, yes. Like it sh shortens the time to learn stuff. You can ra uh, run all the examples. You can get into, into things. You can even really very quickly build your local, very quick and low latency environment with DuckDB and use it for, for testing. We put a lot of attention actually for our destinations to all of them behave in the same way. There are like thousands of tests that we wrote to make sure that every destination starting from the vector databases, even into like a parquet files on the bucket. From the point of view of our users, they behave in the same way. They're gonna have the same schemas. You can, if, if DBT is supported for this destination, it's gonna be the same, you know, set of transformations so you can develop locally and then run the same code on CI and then deploy it, yes, and this is, really good for data quality, yes, because you can test it. There are many other mechanisms like that. Uh, like we are pretty strong software engineering approach, as, as I said, so we really pay a lot of attention to uh, to follow this Python intuitions, yes, to not reinvent new stuff, but to use actually existing building blocks. So for example, all our sources are generators, yes, like a Python generators. And you don't need to create some obscure object model. You, People know it. Yes, they know what they are and they can use them right away. The same like a destinations. You can now build your own destinations that are like a things that, that consume data. Yes. So you use this something called Python decorator. You just decorate a function and you have reverse ETL uh, thingy that you know took you maybe one hour to, to produce. So now we are like a little bit coming to, to the second part of your question our investments into sources and uh, destinations. We actually built a very interesting thing, like a really good support for uh, creating REST APIs, pipe, REST API uh, pipelines. We have like a support for like, imperative modes when you write code uh, with paginators, authenticators, and so on. So it's like a low-level toolkit. But there is also 
higher level toolkit, like a declarative mode. And it's combined with the uh, code generation tool, which is converting open API uh, definitions into directly into pipelines and data sets. But actually, you, de you declare what you want. You build your tree of called resources, and very quickly, you can define your pipeline and just run it. Yes. So we, we know that people love it. We get, uh, are getting a lot of feedback. We see hundreds of those in production. Yes. So actually, that was like a, our big achievement. We did similar things for like a database and file, file system sync. We standardized this. Uh, we let people declare tables, uh, databases, combine them, and very quickly uh, create pipelines that you know, sync databases. I think this is the most popular source of okay, this database right now. Yeah. And I would say REST API is the second one. And I want to put a particular emphasis on this one because it was built with lots of, let's say, community pool. So the REST API declarative source is just a Python dictionary. And it was originally, you know, somebody donated to us some code where they had a take on this. So we used it as inspiration. Then uh, we had more people from the community basically asking that we build something like this. And eventually we actually built it with community members, right? They did like half the work, I guess. And uh, it's uh, it's literally our second most used source. So it's a big success. Yeah. On that point of developer experience, onboarding, speed of experimentation, one of the ways that in my experience has always been most effective to encourage that is having sane and useful defaults. And I know that a lot of the investment in this overall space of building libraries of sources and destinations for data movement is to have some standardized protocol for the data interchange, whether that's going back to the Unix shell with the pipe operator and just being able to operate on arbitrary strings or the Singer specification, the Airbyte specification. I'm wondering how you've approached that aspect of this space and how you think about the data interchange protocol between the source and destination particularly given that you're trying to move large volumes of data so you don't want to have to spend a lot of time on serialization and deserialization? All right, this is a very good question. And actually, our users uh, interact mostly with the code, yes? Uh, this like internals are also available. So we have this uh, hacking principle that you always can get into internal and, and use it like at the lower level stuff. But maybe I, I'll start with this um, uh, defaults, yes? Same defaults that you mentioned. So we actually put a lot of attention that into let people use some minimalistic, really minimalistic code without setting any kind of options. We spent a lot of time to figure out what are the best settings for different things. And we are trying to set up this in a way that, that works. Sometimes it's a little bit conservative, but we are like a, making sure that you can very quickly start and then improve your, your thing, yes? So you can start without almost without learning, yes? When you need something special, then you need to learn. Yes, so that's that's our approach. We don't want you to learn some object model before you even use it. So that's that's one thing. Second thing, actually, we do not have any kind of protocol. We are using this open formats everywhere we can. Uh, right now, our primary citizen is Parquet file. So uh, when we extract, uh, and that's another interesting story. We, we year, year ago, people really had serious doubts. Can you really do any kind of bigger loads with Python? And we realized, yes, but you need to use Arrow, you need to use Connector X, you need to use Polars. And then we did it. And now, you know, our interchange protocol is a, is a Parquet file. And, uh, uh, internally, we form simply like a, you know, repositories or packet files with a manifest, which is a schema that can be a YAM file, or can be a Pydantic model, whatever people prefer. And this is being exchanged between different stages, among different stages of DLT. Yes. So the last stage is a load stage. It's a destination. And it looks into this, it looks uh, what is the schema and loads the packet files into, into the uh, into the destination, yes. So ideally, we are not doing any, if you are working with the arrow tables, you can you just save it once and then pass it to the load stage and it's not deserialized. It's deserialized by the engine at the end. So I would also try to answer this in a way that data engineers would relate more easily <laughs> maybe. And that is, you typically would have a source to destination protocol because the source is passing data and metadata. The way DLT works is a little different. You basically have a component in the middle that is doing this metadata inference for you. 
So what this means is the source is only emitting data. You don't need to worry about metadata. If, data, if metadata is available, we can capture that, but it's not necessary. So what this means is you're just yielding JSON or data frames or, you know, like Machin said, maybe some, think... yeah. Yeah, the fact that you're able to use some of those native constructs, Pyro in particular, I can see as being immensely valuable from a performance perspective, because if you're using Arrow for the source and the destination, then they can just operate on the same block of memory. You don't have to deal with that save and load step in the middle. Yeah, that's true. I think this is part of your uh, question about this high performance libraries. This is one of the things that we see. A lot of things got standardized. Maybe it's like a de facto standard, it's not a real standard, but you know, this table format, which is RO, it's a huge benefit for the ecosystem. Another interesting aspect from that performance perspective is the ability to parallelize and in particular with Python 3.13 having the no gill option and being able to do free threading. I'm wondering what you've seen as far as experimenting with that and some of the ways that that impacts the ways that you think about building and deploying these pipelines. Yes, yeah, so actually we were experimenting a lot, maybe not with this uh, no gill option, but you know, most of this Rust based libraries, they release the gill immediately. So uh, we were recently uh, building Delta Lake on Delta RS, and uh, we were like checking if this is really a parallel processing. If, even if you have one process in Python and you have many threads, of course, they're gonna get serialized because there is GIL. But Delta RS is nice and it's releasing this GIL, so I think it's giving you a little bit of this new Python experience, like uh, Python 13. And, uh, and it really works in parallel. Yes, we check that and uh, you can actually write to many tables at once, do merges to many tables at once, which uh, is using data fusion. So it's a lot of processing as well, like a CPU processing, and we see that it works. So really we think we're gonna benefit with this more with this high performance libraries than with the changes in the Python uh, itself. Python is getting more and more glue code, very nice abstraction for the user as well. It's like an interface to the deeper things and. Our task is to hide it and just expose what people can really understand and, uh, you know, and, and interact. As I was preparing for this conversation and reading through your various blog posts, one of the things that captured my attention the most is this idea of a portable data lake and the impact that it has on going from local development to production, the challenges that exist on that journey. That's something that has been true for years, probably decades at this point. I'm wondering if you can summarize the ideas in that post and maybe talk to what are the missing pieces that would make that fully portable data lake something that can be properly realized? So I uh, I could start with like a, this more technical perspective on this. What, what had to come together in order to enable this? I mean, we talk about this already. Less. So let's start with the high performance libraries, yes? So you need actually to somehow create, maintain, vacuum this, this, uh, this uh, data lakes, yes? For that, this, uh, this libraries that do that, that had to, to, be, to, be, to be ready for this. Then a lot of stuff got standardized. I mean, this is what I mentioned, like it's, it's probably de facto standard, not a really, but it, it got standardized, starting from like a table format in memory, which is Arrow. And so we, we also have, finally have like a working, we have Iceberg. Yes, we have, uh, we have Delta. So those things are standardized and you, you can interact with this. Another thing that happened, you have this uh, portable square engines. Yes, yeah? so you know, Delta RS is, is data fusion. And now you have DuckDB. With DuckDB, you can connect to any kind of store via so-called scanners and you know, read data from Delta, read data from Iceberg, read data from Postgres, from Parquet Files, yes? So, and you can move this engine close to your data. This is a big benefit, yes? Without this benefit, there could be little reason probably to build these lakes. Yeah, and you know, you also have this uh, transformation engines that are trying to replace DBT, maybe like SQL Mesh or transformation en engines that are working on data frames, like Hamilton, for example, they are also like, a, you know, making this experience with the portable data lakes way better and also way cheaper. Yes, because you don't need to transform on Snowflake. Yes, you can now transform uh, with data frame or you can transform with DuckDB plus DBT if you want the old style. It's, I think, did have to come together in order to create enough value for people to adopt this stuff. And I would say there is also a community aspect that is important, and that is demand. So something that I think many of us have noticed is there is 
been a lot of talk about iceberg, a lot of talk about Delta, but limited adoption. So of course it's more in some areas than others. But for example, if you look at iceberg, it really exploded this year. So particularly, I think in January, in uh, just before the acquisition of Tabular by Databricks, Iceberg was about two times the search volume compared to Delta, right? So something is happening. And now with the recent acquisition, that's even more publicity. Uh, I would say by now, Iceberg is a bit of a trigger word for many. You say Iceberg, everyone's going to tell you all the new things they're working on, kind of. Yeah, I think that the growth of Iceberg has definitely accelerated a lot, which is great to see. It's definitely excellent that there has been a lot lot of investment as far as the tooling to be able to integrate with that effectively. So DuckDB, as you mentioned, the fact that there is Pi Iceberg to be able to directly interact with the tables without having to have a query engine in the middle, and then also just all of the different query engines integrating with that. So Trino, even Snowflake has invested in Iceberg support for being able to either query across Iceberg tables or use that as a native ingest path. And then in terms of your experience of building DLT, the fact that it's open source is great. That obviously helps with community adoption. But at the end of the day, you also have to have some path to sustainability. I'm wondering, as you have continued to build and invest in the tooling and grow the community, how have you worked on formulating the strategy for being able to build a sustainable product on top of that foundation? So in essence, you're asking, where is the money coming from, right? And I would say, you know, for the last six months, we've been quite successful at doing support. So we've had several types, let's say, of support that we see Fortune 500 companies ask us for, from, let's say, consulting to classic support. Second, uh, we have a very successful OSS motion. And right now, as we were talking about, you know, portable data lake earlier, what this is, it's basically a dev environment for people who just want to go from local to production and easily develop these data platforms. And right now we're uh, in design part partnerships with uh, multiple customers and we're building this together. And uh, we can see in more detail that there is this movement in the market towards open compute. And we think this is something that we'll be ready for very soon. Yes, we learn a lot from what our customers are building as well. Yes, so uh, you can actually build a lot of things on top of DLT as a library. Yes, so, and that's, this is where we go product-wise, observing and building, reproducing certain solutions. In your experience of building the project, working with end users and growing that community, what are some of the most interesting or innovative or unexpected ways that you've seen DLT used? Yeah, so actually, actually, this is a really good question, yes. Uh, our users are extremely smart. Yes, they are extremely smart. The, the people that are using DLT are typically builders. They build their own data platforms. And we somehow get used to the fact that our situation, that our users are ahead of us, like in, in ways that they think about DLT, how they ca can apply it. Yes, I can give you a few, a few examples. Yes, so uh, we, uh, our earliest big production deployment was at Harness, which is like a CI company, yes, and a pretty, pretty big one. And actually, uh, DLT was more than a year ago, it was a year and a half ago. It was already used to create a data platform that got integrated, in like a, Harness has, has its own object model on top of which can build UIs. So it got integrated into UIs, yes, and uh, automatically they were generated certain, you know, user interfaces and people that needed data, they could just interact with this interface and DLT would produce the data set on demand. Yeah? So it's like a data democracy movement. So then we realized, yes, this is, this is really new and this is you know, where DLT can go. Yes? Then uh, we also had like a, a team of data scientists, team of data scientists that use DLT plus, Pan, plus Pandas plus Monday.com, which is like a list, so you can maintain lists of things in there to build a whole CMS. Yes with the machine learning component that is serving millions of users. They are not engineers, they are very smart data scientists, and like stitching the stuff together, they build a true data platform that does the work. Yes, so that was really amazing to see that, you know, that people that are not engineers can also you know, build this kind of stuff. User-facing products. Yes, absolutely impossible without Python and the libraries and so on. Then recently, uh, we built our first big Delta Lake with post hoc. Uh, and actually, this is a really interesting case when Delta Lake is not done for internal use. It's actually a way to interact with the customers. So what we can learn from it, like a 
Typically, you would build a REST API and some open API interface, and people would build REST clients to take data. Now you can no, interact with the data lake. You can interact with the lake. There are schemas, there are tables. You can use whatever engine you want. You can bring the engine close to your data. It's extremely effective. So I think there is really something new, and we want to learn from it. I, I could continue really like a, we, we had users that are, were building asynchronous uh, destinations uh, and asynchronous sources before us. So like a take data from Postgres extremely quickly via AsyncIO. So this is really a lot. And the most recent development is people are using Cursor AI to automate code generation. And they are like feeding the documentation, creating some set of rules. You know, the pipelines are being generated for them. So, I mean, we expected that, but it's like a users did that way before we could even, you know, make a first proof of concept that is already in production. So this is amazing. Yes, it's like a, having people that are using your stuff. For me as an engineer, it's extremely fulfilling. But, you know, using in a way that I didn't expect, this is the best part. Yes, and this is happening every day. You mentioned, to being able to build a data platform. And that's another topic area that you focused on in your blog posts and your messaging and positioning is the idea of DLT being a core tool in the toolbox of data platform engineers. And I'm wondering if you can talk to some of the ways that you think about what does a data platform engineer do? How does DLT help them? And what are some of the ways that they expose those platform capabilities to the consumers of the platform to be able to build on top of that and the role that DLT plays in that relationship? So I would say data platform is something that gets thrown around a lot, but really it's just a technical representation of a data stack, be it a data warehouse or a data lake or whatever you're doing. Basically, where this uh, data platform engineer role is new is that what they're doing is they're enabling other data people do their job better. So basically, they put together systems that essentially create ways for data developers to create pipelines faster, easier, cleaner, let's say boilerplate code. The, all kinds of things, right? From governance to engineering. And yeah, this is what we basically observe all the time. So I mentioned this like unexpected things that happens. And the pattern that we see is that people are building, we call it like a data platforms in a box that, uh, that are like a, a way to, to bundle certain entities that you can create with DLT. So, you know, sources, destinations, data sets, schemas, contracts. All together, create a package, yes, which can be you now developed locally on DuckDB, but deployed on CI on some you no know, test uh, environment, and then deployed by the infra people. They can hand over the same package to the infra people, and they can deploy exactly the same thing to the production environment. Yes, yeah? so this is what we see people are building, so like a port portable or people installable platforms. Yes, so as Adam mentioned, that have the whole stack inside. But this is also the way people expose this to the data users. This is it's very interesting. Of course, this is not in every company, but in the companies that have strong data science team, they typically bundle this kind of platform, expose just certain things uh, as a Python interface, and those people can interactively, for example, uh, work with the data frames, but the data frames are coming from the data lake, for example, yes? And then you can train your model directly on the data that is uh, that is stored somewhere without even knowing, using SQL or doing this kind of stuff. And it's the same code, it's the same set it's just like a, this portable platform, as we call it. Yeah, and I would say deeper than the technical aspect is also governance, right? Because when you have a uniform way of ingesting things, you have standardization, you have schemas up front, and basically, I don't know, you're probably familiar with the concept of data mesh. What data mesh is uh, advocating is basically that domains are more self-sufficient, so domain knowledge is basically captured and fed into metadata for pipelines that allows basically the organization to understand what this data is. So the way you can think about DLD with its schema, with its data contracts, it's quite close to that. And we're working on semantic capabilities that will basically create these, allow these data contracts to do way more advanced things such as data meshing or let's say PII data contracts. Yeah, definitely very excited to see the continued evolution in that regard as well. So I'll be keeping a close eye on your activities there. In your experience of building this tool building a business, building a community, what are some of the most interesting or unexpected or challenging lessons that you've each learned in that process? 
I can start with a challenging lesson, and this one is a little painful. Uh, so we were working on pipeline generation because, you know, LLMs, it seemed to all make sense. And this is how we came upon the open API in it. So the challenge there is that you have a number of, let's say, pieces of information that you need in order to generate a pipeline. And if you are using an LLM to guess them, then the error rate will compound. So essentially, by the time you have a finished pipeline, Pipeline, it's probably not working. So we realized this approach, basically the technology is not there for it. So we went down an algorithmic path. So we figured, hey, we have almost everything in OpenAPI. We can infer the rest. And what cannot be inferred can be manually tweaked by the user. So we created this generator that basically scans an OpenAPI spec and uh, creates a REST API source from it. But nobody cared. So we were expecting, you know, that maybe people that are working with fast API that basically use this uh, standard or maybe people from the community but literally we we couldn't find people who care yeah and that was a little bit unexpected yes it yeah. was like a, from the technical point of view it's like an amazing thing yes you have information you can uh, create some kind of thing automatically but actually people prefer to it's so easy without that so they probably don't want to learn another, another tool it's easier for them to just uh, write a simple python dictionary and there is one uh, very interesting thing i already mentioned it was like a, when we were doing doing this uh, production uh, Delta Lake with post hoc, we realized we had this for, for a long time, we had this like uh, idea, like this core idea of our project is that, you know, that we can convert any REST API into the data set. Yes, because people that interact with REST APIs, if they are consumers of the data, they don't, they don't want to have HTTP calls to some endpoint. They want to interact with data sets. And now we, we see something really new, like the user interface not even going to be REST API. It's going to be some kind of lake. Yes, with the very different schema, some data catalog that is possibly auto-generated because it's a lot of work to generate a catalog. And this is how it's going to be how we're gonna interact, how the companies are gonna interact with the other companies or with the customer. This is a this is a super new. Yes, we are thinking how to make it easier, how to automate it. Yes, it's we think it's it's gonna be a part of this lake revolution that is happening. One thing that I was just realizing that we didn't touch on explicitly is for a lot of this conversation, we've been leaning more towards the idea of structured data sources and destinations. We mentioned the ability to integrate with these AI stacks. I'm wondering what are some of the ways that you think about being able to easily address unstructured data sources and be able to either consume that as is or turn that into a structured representation and some of the experiments that you've done internally and some of the ways that you've seen teams addressing that challenge in their own work that are are using DLT for that? Yes, this is a good question. Yes, so um, obviously DLT, like uh, the uh, the biggest value you get when you can somehow take something that is unstructured and convert that is something that is structured at the other end. Yes, this is why DLT exists. Yes, so of course we started with the messy JSON files, but uh, and we did it like a really long, long time ago. You can also use any of these libraries that are, let's say, parsing and converting uh, PDFs into some kind of meaningful structures or things that convert any messy files into a created schema on top of them and, and then uh, you, you can convert them into the data sets. So you can actually plug any kind of Python library or, or even a platform that does it into DLT as a source, yes? We call it a structured source. We, we have it for people that want to use it uh, in our verified sources. They, they can try it out. So that's the one thing. Second thing, like a, uh, we also integrate with these frameworks that people typically use, like a long chain. Uh, it's not even integration. You know, we, we are you know, our sources are generators. Yes? So you can just take them and use them with long chain. You don't need to do anything. You can, uh, or you can pass launching documents into DLT and we're gonna also, you know, automatically parse them. So all of the things that you, let's say, have like a, this launching apps or like launching plugins for our unstructured data, you can, you can interact with DLT uh, through it almost automatically. The other style of data sources and destinations in particular that has been gaining a lot of attention right now are property graphs because of the renewed interest in knowledge graphs because of the advent of graph rag. And I'm curious how you have seen people using DLT in that context as well for being able to populate and maintain some of these property graphs. 
So yes, I'm, we know that people are using uh, you know, GraphQL to query this as a data source. I'm not aware personally of, of people doing this. Uh, uh, things with DLT right now. Me neither. All right. Well, something to keep your eye on. So for people who are working in data teams, they have a need to be able to move data from point A to point B. What are the cases where DLT is the wrong choice? Um, like we touched upon before, if you're not a Python first person, and if you don't want, if you don't care about software development, best practices and this kind of stuff, then don't use DLT. It's not for you. DLT is for Python first data teams. Outside of this, I would say not much to worry about, right? It's literally by Python data people for Python data people. And as you continue to build and invest in DLT and DLT Hub, what are some of the things you have planned for the near to medium term and areas that you're excited to explore further and invest in? So like we were telling you, this pip install portable Pythonic data lake, uh, we think this is a tectonic shift. So there's going to be a lots of work that can be done there. I would say there are a few major areas from open compute to clean, easy dev environment and so on. But notably, I guess, uh, besides a list of features, uh, one thing that we'll be doing short term is actually some customer roadshows in November, showcasing this uh, data lake product. So we'll be in San Francisco, New York City, Paris, Berlin. If anyone is interested, just get in touch with us on Slack. We might also add other locations. All right. Are there any other aspects of the work that you're doing on DLT and this overall space of data movement that we didn't discuss yet that you would like to cover before we close out the show? I think that your questions are, were very, really very interesting and comprehensive. And we touched the things that we really consider the most important. So how you really being a part of this ecosystem, being a part of this AI revolution, yes, and the way these new workflows that uh, are there. Uh, how you benefit from everything that is beneficial to others, you also benefit, yes? So if people are building a new library, yes, there is, a, for example, a new uh, way to manage Python dependencies when you can ship a script as an executable. It's called UV, it's some model after the cargo from Rust. And now we are using this for a few days and it's amazing. And it's adding so much power to the, the product that we are building when portability, PIP instability is important. So I'm, I'm, no, I'm amazed by this ecosystem simply and this way of, of doing stuff. I'm not sure this is DLT related, it's more like a, being an engineer in, in the space for a long time and seeing this kind of thing working, it's, it, this, is, this is really fulfilling. Absolutely. Well, for anybody who wants to get in touch with either of you and follow along with the work that you're doing, I'll have you add your preferred contact information to the show notes. And as the final question, I'd like to get your perspectives on what you see as being the biggest gap in the tooling or technology that's available for data management today. I wouldn't say it's a gap that we have today. I would say it's a shortcoming that is coming from the way we design data stacks and it's uh, maybe here to stay maybe one day it will move away but uh, i think the biggest problem that we have right now in the data space is the lack of interoperability of tools right and uh, the fact that when you're building a data stack you're literally just human middleware stitching together some technologies and uh, you know your documentation is probably going to be a little bit outdated there's going to be gotchas there's going to be all kinds of things that maybe other people stumbled into uh, and it's your first time but essentially if you look even at the way tools interact they interact by looking at data in a database this doesn't have metadata which means that the amount of things that you can do with it are by nature very limited. And I think once we can get away from this concept that metadata just needs to be added to every tool or created every time and we only move data around, a major change can occur. Before this, I think, you know, we're just all stitching together vendor tools. Well, thank you both very much for taking the time today to join me and share the work that you've been doing on DLT. It's definitely a very interesting project. Definitely excited to see the ways that it's evolving. Definitely going to be playing around with that and experimenting with how it fits into some of my new projects that are coming. So appreciate all the time and energy that you've both put into that and the rest of your team. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having us and have a great day as well. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to check out our other shows. 
Podcast.net covers the Python language, its community, and the innovative ways it is being used. And the AI Engineering Podcast is your guide to the fast-moving world of building AI systems. Visit the site to subscribe to the show, sign up for the mailing list, and read the show notes. And if you've learned something or tried out a project from the show, then tell us about it. Email hosts at dataengineeringpodcast.com with your story. And to help other people find the show, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell your friends and coworkers. Thank you.